We're going to start in about two minutes. David, just tell me when to start now. To shut off the music and we'll start. Perfect. Good. Okay. And we're ready to start. Good, good. Okay. Perfect. I know, I'm going to do the announcements. Huh? Yeah. Just want to, want to close the door? Yeah. Okay. All right, you guys ready? Close the doors and we're ready to go. Okay, welcome to the lighthouse. Yeah, we just want to close the door. Perfect. Okay, today's class is in, um, in, in from Bathsheba Haber, Visrot Tavor for Bathsheba Bat Esther, Bathsheba uh, Bracha, uh, the Dubitsky family, Michael, the entire lighthouse, and I'm with me. Ariella Geller for the Bracha Hasach of their life together with Abraham Mir, Ariella Masha, and Shoshana Bakaya. Anonymous in the merit of Miriam's family. Anonymous for Four Shalema of Anina Yom Tov Lipa, Ben Chai Bracha. Good? Okay. And in memory of Devorah Fega Bat Shmuel, Menachem Mendel Ben Achanan Tzvi. All right. Good? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, God willing, February 19th, we're going to be in, God willing, uh, uh, Manhattan, we're going to be in Parkway Synagogue, and Vizrat Hashem, in mid-March, we're going to be in Chicago and Philadelphia. Today is a very special night, tonight's in the yard site of the Holy Baba Sali. Baba Sali means master of prayer. Baba Sali, I had many miracles in the Shkut of Baba Sali every single year, that it's Baba Sali's yard site, something always happens to me. There's a big, big, big person should light a candle tonight and go to the Baba Sali and ask, and ask Hashem to open up the doors in heaven. So again, tonight's the Baba Sali's yard site. Big, big, big deal. I've seen many, many miracles, God willing. Tonight's class, we're going to talk about self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. What does Rabbi Nachum talk about self-sacrifice? We're going to talk about the Noam Meli Melech. We're going to talk about the Baal Shem Tov. What is the value of, of sacrifice? If you want something you never had before, you have to do something you never did before. This is a very Jewish concept. Sometimes Hashem gives us issues in our life 
in order to get stuck, to get out of our comfort zone. All growth comes out of a person's comfort zones. We need to understand that. So remember, in order to have something you never had before, you have to do something you never did before. This could be forgiving, this could be trying on something. For some people, self-sacrifice could be keeping Shabbat. Another person's self-sacrifice could be eating kosher. I know the first time I started eating kosher, it was a self-sacrifice, giving up those restaurants. There's a lot of sacrifice. Once you start giving sacrifice in your life, that's where magic happens. And we need to understand this. We know this from, from the Parsha of the Week, um, last week, how the God rewarded the dogs because they didn't bark when the, when the Jews left. Because the natural indication of a, of, a, of a dog is to bark. And because they did not bark, the Parak Shira says that they got rewarded that from the, the tefillin that we wear, the, the coloring of the hides is made from dog excrement. Can you imagine? From the excrement of a dog is made the coloring for your tefillin that you wear the highest, holiest things made from excrement of dog. It goes to tell you, and the, and, the, and the sages say, the reward for that was because they did not open up their mouth. They did not bark. They went against their nature. When we go against our nature, which is the most impossible thing to do, is where you get crazy, crazy, crazy rewards for. So think about if you want if you want to have shalom bite in 2020, you have to go against your nature. If you, if you, if there's nothing in this world. If you want to get something you never had before, you have to do something you never did before. This is exactly what we're 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 going to go talk about. We're going to talk about also how God creates these obstacles in our lives for the sake and see how much how much sacrifice do you have for those things. So when we start looking at it, we still look at it completely different. I want to start with a little story from the Baal Shem Tov, and that story really sums up everything. You know, stories about Sadiqim have a power to purify a person. Why do we speak about stories of Sadiqim so much? Because unfortunately today, many people are asleep. They're asleep to life. Whether it's stress, whether it's... And, and I get it. I get it. People are going through tremendous obstacles. And they don't have the head sometimes to be told what to do. They don't have the head to be lectured. I get it. So what happens is from Nachman knew that people don't have the head today. They don't have the head. Back then they didn't have the head. Imagine today if people have the head today. They don't have the head today for this. People don't have the head. It's normal. And sometimes I don't have the head. So you need, a, you need a story. Because stories have the ability to wake people up. And the Baal Shem Tov was one, one, one thing about the Baal Shem Tov. He gave these stories, and they, they're so simple, these stories. But these stories could be told to anybody because they wake people up from sleep. Believe it or not, in my drug rehab facility, if I tell them, listen guys, you got to read the 12 steps, you got to do this, you gotta, they're not in the head for that. You need stories right away. When they stories, a person hears a story, or a person hears an alumni speaking, they can get aroused from a simple story without instructions. So the Baal Shem Tov said something, and, I, and this story is really, uh, it's so simple, but it's so beautiful, and it pretty much sums up your, your, your life. A woman went to the Baal Shem Tov, who was visiting in her town and begged him to give her a baby boy. She had faith in his blessing, and it would certainly be fulfilled. We know the, ba- the Baba Sali many times, how many times he, he gave people lemons. Here you go, eat this melon, you're going to be cured. <coughs> have a piece of, uh, have, drink a rack, and you'll be cured. It was so many miracles that he, he channeled through food, because it had, people's belief systems were completely off. So all of a sudden, if they start taking something tangible, now they have something to believe. So what did, what did the Baal Shem Tov say? The Baal Shem Tov says, okay, what are you going to give me? You want a baby boy? What are you going to give me? This woman had nothing to give him. She was a very poor lady. She says that since people usually give a, t- a tzaddik a gift for a blessing, she told him that she was poor and she had nothing to give him except a katina. A katina is an inexpensive scarf. The Baal Shem Tov told her to give it to him and she would have a baby boy. All of a sudden, the woman went to go get this scarf. But as soon as she left, the Baal Shem Tov got into his coach and he traveled all the way back to Mezibush. Imagine the lady's going to go get the only thing she has and next thing you know, he leaves. He leaves. It's gone. She took the cape, followed him, walking from city to city, suffering great hardship until she finally arrived in Mezibush. When she arrived to see the Baal Shem Tov, he took the katina from her, hung it on the peg, and says, now you're going to have a baby boy. 
Why did the Baal Shem to make this poor woman's only... Why did he have to take this her only possession? Why did he have to create this... Why did he not only take the her only possession, but make her, make her follow him from city to city to city? Because, he says, very simple. Because he knew that if she gave him her gift, this would be followed by the self-sacrifice, her reward would match the effort. I've seen some people suffer three, four years single and they prayed, and they begged, and they are crying, and the guys they got was worth that, was worth that zivug. Not every zivug is going to come to you easy. You want a good zivug, you better get on your, better get on, start praying, and start crying. That's what Hashem wants. It's not so simple, because the, the tears that you're going to be crying, and praying, and begging God, are the vessels that are being made as soon as you do it. You need to understand that. Just like this woman, she had to go run and run and bittle herself and go in the sun and suffer and give her only possession. But that itself was building the keli, that itself was building the sacrifice for the reward that she got. Her son became a big scholar, her son became this, etc. Like we said, some shiduch, look at her, look at yeah, yeah, yeah. He said it took 37 years to get a shidduch. You want that kind of zivug? You have to wait. So sometimes a person could get very desperate and could get very lonely and get, get very, it sees that there's no hope. But behind the scenes, they're building a tremendous, tremendous keli for him. And it's, the only thing you have to do is, is to think of that. If you don't think of that, you're going to fall into despair. So recognize, ask yourself, how much sacrifice am I putting? Am I swiping or am I praying? Swipe, you, maybe you get arthritis from swiping. Or you're begging God. That's what God wants, sacrifice. I can't tell you. I've sacrificed, between you and me, a lot of hours of sleep to do these classes every day. No question. You have time to sleep, sleep faster. Depending on what you want. You have, like, have sacrifice. You have to sacrifice. Maybe sometimes five hours of sleep, four hours of sleep. You have to sacrifice. This is the story of life. And this is what Rav Nachman teaches you. If you're not willing to sacrifice, you are not going to get much in life. And you need to understand that. Because the sacrifice is what creates the vessel to receive the blessing. You recognize that sometimes, I've, I've done it the whole week, we're talking about Tomer Devorah. People have had cancers go away because they sacrificed themselves. They gave into their own intuition. They said, I forgive you. Sacrifice. There's nothing free in life. You need to understand that. And like we said before last week, if it's free, it's not good for you. And the amount of toil that you put, like I said in the beginning, was about to do six months before I even got answered. Six months. So you need to understand. Don't focus on the moment. Don't focus on the prize. Focus on the process. If I know self-sacrifice equals big blessing, and remember, guys, I think we're doing this three years. I hear stories all day long. I've seen miracles, and I thank God. You know, that's what gives me a lot of hope to see people getting constant miracles. They get miracles. I'm getting, I'm between you and me, I get maybe two, three, four invitations every month. People, thank God for the classes I got married. Thank God for, it's happening. It's happening. The invitations are coming. The invitations are coming. Not in Miami usually, but they're coming in New York, they're coming somewhere else. Miami, they're invitation to the Super Bowl, live, other kind of invitations. But there's invitations, there's people getting married every day. And I just want to give the singles hope that, you know, the, the work has to be done in private. You want, you want to be rewarded in public, you need to do the work in private. That's just like the lady, look, what are you willing to give? You know, sometimes I ask singles, okay, well, what are you willing to give? What are you willing to give up on this? You know, before they tell me they want this, 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 like a car. I want the sunroof, black, white, rims, 22 inch rims, you know, the whole, like they're picking a car. This, 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 this. Like it would be so easy to do that. What are you willing to sacrifice? The person has two kids. Are you willing to sacrifice yourself for two kids? The question. Are you willing to sacrifice dealing with the next husband? Are you willing to sacrifice dealing with... There's going to be a sacrifice! What is the price? What is your price? And according to your price is your reward. What, is your, what are you willing to sacrifice for your sleep for, to be able to get closer to God? Imagine if you sacrificed a half an hour of sleep to do his bodhidu, how much your life would change. But sleeping is comfortable. And sometimes you have to get up when it's cold. Sometimes you have to get up when it's nasty and you're exhausted. 
that is the sacrifice. And those days, it's even the, it's the best prayers. But don't expect anything in life without sacrifice. First, this is what I need to understand. We need to get the people's mindset. I think people are not prepared today. They're just they're expecting a lot of things and things are not happening. And Ramachna tells you, no. You make the sacrifice and then you ask. First sacrifice, then you could start asking heaven why things are not moving. But today, a lot of people are asking things in heaven, but they're not sacrificing anything. Not sacrificing anything. Reb Nachman says in Sefer Midot, miracles are only performed for a person who's willing to sacrifice himself for God. It's not going to be, you're not going to get a miracle reading the Course on Miracles. Okay? You're not going to get a miracle on that. You're going to be a miracle. It's, spirituality is not going to Jamba Juice and hanging out and spin cycle and all this, you know, what, what today they tell you is spiritualist or a weekend warrior or... or all these silly shirts. It's the darkness. Giving up my own nature. Giving up my favorite restaurant that I love on the water. I decide to eat kosher. Ooh! You know what kind of sacrifice that is? Giving up my own nature. Giving up money when, where I earn to tzedakah. Rav Nachman says the beginning of giving tzedakah is cruelty. God commanded a raven to feed Elijah. Why did he command a raven? Because a raven does not even feed its own children. So he commanded a raven, not only to feed, to feed Elijah, somebody else. And he says, just like we're starting any new path in spirituality, you need to have, it, you, it involves a person breaking his body like cruelty. Like a raven breaking his nature, we have to break our nature. To break our nature. You want Shalom Bayit? To break your nature. You have to know how to be quiet. You have to know how to be silent. You have to know how to accept Busha Bismcha. You know how hard that is to do. But that's how you score. That's how you score. Score in heaven. But you can be right or you can be happy. You can't have both. Moroccan, this doesn't make a difference. Like we said, Sephardic is a warm war, Ashkenazi is a cold war. It's still a war. Cold missiles, silent missiles, boom, different missiles. Uh, we, there's, a war, there's a war regardless. Rabbi Nachman says, a person who rejoices in, in his suffering brings salvation to the world. Imagine that. When you rejoice in your salvation, which is again, breaking your thoughts and, and, and embracing happiness, embracing a, already an anticipation of a miracle before, is also self-sacrifice. Because it's easy to pick up a phone and be addicted to negative thinking. It's easy. It doesn't require any effort. But to really fight that negative thought and question it, self you're sacrificing you. It's very painful at times. Miracles are only performed for a person who has been tested. You get tested, you get a testimony. Ask yourself, this is the test. Why? Because again, when you get tested, you get the reward. Rabbi Nachman says something very beautiful. And this, this, gave, this line gave me a lot of hope when I was going through very difficult challenges. It says, before God performs a miracle for a person, a person will fall, first fall on bad times. He's going to fall on bad times. The difficulty that he's going to go through in those times is determined by the greatness of the miracle about to be performed on his behalf. Look at that. This is, I can say this all the time. The tzimtzum, the lack of light, the lack of clarity, is already creating the rise for you. What do you do in those tough times? What do you do? If you hang in there, you get the rise. If you bail out, you don't get nothing. So you recognize it's just like we're like the moon. The moon's empty, the moon's full, the moon's half. This is our moods. This is our constant swings. You, you, and, and no matter how much you teach this, you can't avoid it. You can't avoid it. You can't avoid the constant daily mood swings, and the, which he's going to talk about now. You can't even avoid it. You just have to really, really fight, Rabbi Nachman says. When a person finds himself being tested, he should realize that if he withstands this test, God will perform a miracle for his behalf. 
So now you recognize as soon as something happens that you don't understand why, it's a test. Right away, label it a test. Label it. It's a test. Shh. Observe. It's it. It's a test. You know, when somebody passes you a test, you take the test. You don't scream. You don't get angry. It's a test. Specifically, not taking things personal. It's a test. Some things are beyond your comprehension, and they're only there to test you. And when a person passes the test, there's a huge, huge upside. So you don't, all, you don't want to say, creator of the world, don't test me. People say, don't test me. Actually, you don't want to be not tested, because you want the reward. If you don't get tested, then where's the reward? How many times the clients come out of rehab, all of a sudden they come out, next thing you know, their friend calls them, okay, let's use. It's a test. Why is God doing this to me? He wants to elevate you. He wants to elevate you, you've got to be tested. It's going to happen to you all the time. Noam Ali Malik says something very beautiful. And we know one of the biggest tests, our sages say, why did the Red Sea split? Red Sea splitting in your life represents a salvation that you need. Parnasa, Shalabayit, Zivug. This is the Red Sea. Why the Red Sea is compared to what? Twelve lanes. Twelve lanes, twelve versions of prayer. Red Sea, splitting, represents a person having Yeshua in two things. We know it's, it's, it's splitting of the Red Sea is as difficult as having, making money, and it's also as difficult as finding a soulmate, finding a mate. Those two represent splitting of the Red Sea. What was the one reason? Because the Jews did not marry that the sea was split. You know what happened? It split in the marriage of Yosef and Tzadik. When the, when the sea saw that the Moshe, Moshe's bones, I'm sorry, Joseph's bones, you know what happens? He split on, on the marriage. What did Joseph do? He split from Potiphar's wife. The sea split for him. Sometimes you have to split from that person you're dating, and Parnas is going to split for you. I tell all the time, guys, guys, you have to split from that girl, and your mazal will, split, will also split. You have to split from doing that thing. Stop doing those things, and these things are going to split for you. There you know. That represents the salvation. I have to do some kind of split if I want another split to happen. So that's, that's the message that we need to understand. Something I have to split. It could be splitting from being holding a grudge. Split, 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 split from conflict. Split. You get a split up. It's unbelievable. That means really, you know, what, what our sages say when the sea was in front of us, they said, why are you crying out to me? It doesn't depend on me. The normal analysis has nothing to do with me. It depends on you. You need the miracle. You need the merit. Show me some action. Show me an action that you can do. Show me an action. Imagine if a person all of a sudden self-sacrifice for somebody could be keeping Shabbat. For some people, it's self-sacrifice. Because their family doesn't keep it. And they don't know how to do it. And they feel alone. And the next thing you know, somebody putting a phone down for 24 hours is self-sacrifice for people. On that person's level, that person will merit a miracle. It all depends on your level. On another person, could be, again, eating kosh, could be different things. And that's where we have to ask ourselves, what am I willing, if I want something that I never had before, what am I really willing to sacrifice? What am I willing to, I said, I, I want to be, I want, I want to really talk to Hashem, I want to have a conversation. I said, okay, I have to give up sleep. That's my sacrifice, sleep. Sacrifice sleep, you get enlightenment. But you can't have both. You can't have both. That's why really complaining is really is such a waste of time because it doesn't create nothing here and nothing's happening upstairs and like nothing's happening anywhere because we're, we're not doing anything. We're just complaining. That's the frustration. We have to stop complaining and start move, making moves. Making moves down here. The normal Malik says, clearing the paths of higher consciousness. We all want higher consciousness. What does higher consciousness mean? When I have a higher consciousness, I have more energy. Bottom line. That's what the fancy word for consciousness means. More energy. That means, if I have a higher consciousness, I become more enlightened. And the more enlightened I, I become, the less things I take personal, the, 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 the more I will control my emotions, the more I will respond to life instead of react. Higher consciousness, the more, the more clear your prayers are, the, more, the better of a listener you are. The more higher consciousness is, the more you get away from the self. 
So what is the what is what is what is the Noam El Limak say? Something very beautiful. When you first enter the path of divine service, you certainly cannot reach any higher level because you're going to be automatically surrounded by negative thoughts. Don't be upset about the thoughts. That means if I'm getting disturbed in my prayers, if I'm getting disturbed with certain things, it's because there's a lot of thorns in my head. And those thorns must be cut. It's like our sages are saying, you're going to basically wake up to your life and you're going to have a garden full of thorns. And these thorns have to be cut before you want to have, reach higher consciousness. What does he say here? These thoughts that a person goes through, the word zamer, zimirot, when a person sings, and the word zamer means cut. Cut. What you're doing is, your job in life is to cut the certain toxic emotions, certain the toxic habits, cut the certain things that are stopping you from receiving higher consciousness. Don't be upset about it. Just recognizing these are, these are klipot. Today we have a problem. When you, when you tell a guy, listen, how could you date that girl? How could you go out with that girl? She's not for you. She's clear. Just leave her. I have a good shidduch. He can't leave that person. Why? It's a klipa. He's attached to a klipa. It's something. What does a klipa do like we said? Klipa makes you hide your vision. It hides your vision. It covers spirituality. Come, keep Shabbat. Come, keep this. Come, do this. Come, forgive that person. They have a, a klipa does not allow you to reach spirituality. It doesn't allow you to see. It doesn't allow you to see the truth. It covers your eyes, a klipa. And klipas are these shells. They confuse you. They make you nuts. And he says here, the normal Melech, that the path to Hashem is like a garden that is overgrown with thorns and thistles. These represent the wicked powers of impurity. They're like the highest thorns on the highest roses. The most beautiful roses that you're going to have in life, the most beautiful, have so many thorns. And your job is to chop them off. Do not expect, like we said before, to receive a rose, like you see in the mall today, in the box, with already the thorns off. No. There are thorns in there, and you have to chop them off. You have to chop them off. How do you do it? Zemirot. Singing. Singing with what you got. Happiness. Joy. Zamir. Zamer. So what we sing every single time in the prayer for Amidah, it prepares you going from level to level to level. You say Hodu. You say Hallelujah. Because we're reaching new levels every time, so there has to be a song. When you praise, you cut. When a person is, is joyful, like we said, when a person prays with tears, he opens up heaven's doors. When a person prays with happiness, he removes them. <laughs> There's no doors. That's the, that's the benefit. But to get to that level, you have to first really empty your mind. Do whatever you can to get yourself in that higher consciousness. And the only way to do that is by cutting rows. And he says, it's the preparation the preparation, service, and the prayer which you're engaging in, cutting out your next thoughts, even, even before you even start praying, or before you even start going to... Just set, setting down five, ten minutes and contemplating and thinking and removing negativity, that preparation creates the clear mind, and the clear mind creates the voice to be heard. And this is what Yaakov says. Yaakov lived in Egypt. He lived in constriction consciousness. He lived among the klipot. And he had to do what? He had to get rid of them. And we also have this concept that we, if we want any higher consciousness in our lives, we have to first get rid of the klipot that are surrounding us. So that's another aspect. One thing is self-sacrifice. Another thing is recognizing that in order to have self-sacrifice, if I want a healthy shalom bayit, if I want a healthy relationship with my children, there's a lot of klipot. There's a lot of thorns. That means I need, I need patience. I need, I need to surrender at times. I need to be able to, to deal with the struggle. Thank God it's 110 degrees in this room. So this is my clip out right now. Tomer Devorah. This is a book that I've been talking about this week. Strongly recommend Tomer Devorah. Tomer Devorah is all about becoming superhuman. When a person's reading Tomer Devorah, he starts becoming superhuman. Gave a whole class on toxic emotions in Tomer Devorah. Tomer Devorah is basically saying 
like we said before. And str- again, this book is a must read. There, there, you cannot have a house without Tomer Devorah. Because the minute you think of Tomer Devorah, you're going to be thinking, okay, who do I have to forgive? Am I holding something in? Tomer, the, the purpose of Tomer Devorah is to emulate God. Every time you sin, what happens? God doesn't punish you right away. He's patient with you. Why is he patient with you? Because he doesn't take it personal. Why doesn't he take it personal? Because he knows you're not in a good state. You're not in a good state. So what happens? He doesn't, he doesn't take it personal. So he, he has mercy and, ju- and, and, and patience on you. Tomer Devorah teaches the exact same thing. Rav Chaim Kanievsky, a person who came up to Chaim Kanievsky, they couldn't have children for 17 years. And there was a couple that came up to him and they asked him, listen, we can't have children. We're trying everything, we can't have children. He says, listen, it's not in your cards. What can I tell you? It's not meant to be. The woman says, are you crazy? What do you mean it's not meant to be? There's got to be something I'm able to do. There's got to be something I could do to have children. There can't just be this answer. Can't do nothing. All of a sudden, he says, you know what? There's one thing you could do. Rufkan Kenyansky. He says, if you ever see a person getting embarrassed in public, you know, like the famous globalist uh, situation that happened in Manhattan, if you ever see a person getting embarrassed in public and he doesn't answer back, ask him for a bracha right away. And if he gives you a bracha, you will be, you will have a boy. Wow. Well, okay, first of all, who, who, where am I going to find that person? Where am I going to find the person? Where am I going to find the person that gets embarrassed and find it? Next thing you know, there was a foreclosure in one of these uh, cities, and the, the lady that got foreclosed on started screaming, you foreclosed on my house, etc. The guy did not say a word. She says, please bless me right away. The guy blessed her. They had a baby boy. That is the power of getting embarrassed in public and not responding. It's the ultimate self-sacrifice. And he says here, the story occurred because what happens is, what, what was the magic thing? He, came, he broke his nature... By responding back, Hashem had to change their, his nature. Maybe that, that thing was not meant for that. But because there's an alter in nature, in nature, in nature, there's a complete alter in nature, and nature has to alter, alter to you. When you do something, if you want something that you never had before, you have to really go to a special place. This is why the first thing I make people do is right away, the first thing I make people do, let's clean out the mess. Clean out the mess. Who are we forgiving? Because we, we want to invoke mercy. We want to invoke... We don't want to have problems. We don't want to have... We need the mercy. There's another story that says here. And this story, this book is full of stories of people that broke their nature. And the point of this story is when a person transcends his nature for giving insults restraining from his desires, quarreling in anger and swallowing his pride. He rises above his emotion that constrains him. He overcomes his nature. God overcomes his nature for you. You create a new reality. Rabbi Rush always told people, you have a problem, you can't have children, go volunteer. Maybe in heaven they're telling you, you don't deserve those children. But you, but you didn't have to do that either. So because you didn't, you didn't have to do that, heaven doesn't, heaven doesn't have to give you, now they can give you. So it always teaches us in life that if something is not working, I have to do something outside of me. I have to do something outside of me. There's no question from doing all these classes, I didn't have to do them. I got tremendous blessings from this. I didn't have to do the classes. I could chose not to. But I did it. I created a new reality. When you do something different in life, you create a new reality and you go into a different place. You become, it's like a new person comes into a new world. So what happens? The judgment is on the old world, the old you. When you create a new you, you cre- you're, there's a new judgment. It's not the same. That's the power of doing tshuva. Nachman calls it changing garments. Changing garments. O.J. Simpson was driving in a white Bronco. Everybody was looking for him. But if he would have done tshuva, he would have been in a red Corvette. Everybody's looking for the white Bronco. Now he's a new person. We have to also become new people. That's the problem with limiting beliefs. That's the problem with getting stuck in things. You're, you're stuck to dinim. 
when you become a new person, where does the where do judgments really realm? Where do they really hold the most place? When a person becomes stuck in a mindset. Because if I'm stuck in a mindset, that means heaven can only give me as much as I have. Like the Baal Shem Tov story about the guy asking for a blessing for his horse. So he prayed that the horse should be healthy. He didn't, he's not going to be rich because he limited himself to the horse. But when the horse died, it forced himself now to go think something bigger. Then what happened? He merited the miracle from, the, from, from he became rich because he stopped focusing on the horse. And that's the thing that we, sometimes we're too focusing on the horse, too focusing on the object. When you think big, you think unlimited channels in heaven. And this is what he's saying here. For I, Hashem, your God, holy stresses that I'm giving you, based on, our sages say that if we make ourselves holy, then we rise above that level. So there's no such thing, like we said today, there's no such thing as limitations. There's no such thing as limitations. Waking up with limitations, waking up with limiting beliefs itself is, a, is, is terrible. Because you, you, you're, you're constrained. There's no, there's no opening there. You've set that limit up. More talking about klipot. Rab Nachman refers to that there's three major klipot. Again, a klipa is a, is a negative husk. Like we said, there's two, no, there's two klipas that come to a person in prayer. It's called the klipa of Esav and the klipa of Ishmael. The klipa of Esav is when you say, what's the purpose of prayer anyway? I've tried it already. It doesn't work. Like, what did Esav do? Ah, I saw what's the purpose of the birthright. I'm going to die anyway. So Esav said, I'm going to die anyway. Well, who cares if I do this? It's the mindset of hopelessness. The mindset of hopelessness is, what's the difference? Esav, hey, take my firstborn. There's no purpose anyway. Whatever is going to happen is going to happen. Learn helplessness is the nasa of klipa. When a person's belief is no matter what I do, that's nothing's going to change. And then Yishmael's mindset. What was Yishmael? God heard me already. I prayed a long time ago. He heard me already. Yishmael, he heard me. Why should I pray again? Doesn't, it's not going to do nothing. He already heard. If he, he already heard me one time, why does he have to hear me two times? It's a klipa that, get, that gets you not to do something. So anytime you have hesitation, like we said before, I've never seen a person hesitate watching the Super Bowl. I don't, want, I don't know if I should watch the Super Bowl. You know what, let me think about watching the Super Bowl. I've never seen him look at the remote for five minutes and dwell, should I watch the Super Bowl or not? I never saw him have a... I've never, I never seen a person hesitate, specifically in America, on watching the Super Bowl. Never seen I've never seen a person hesitate eating. Especially if it's free. Never seen a person. Never. No flinching. Oh, you want to open up a prayer book? Oh, no, I'm exhausted. You want to start... Do me a favor. Forgive that person. I can't. Do me a favor. Go to the class. Oh, I'm exhausted. But somehow this energy comes to you to sit in a three-hour movie, you don't even blink an eye, to watch binging on Netflix till you, you can't even stop eating popcorn in your face. That, there's no hesitation. But how come I hesitate if I have to do something spiritual? Did you ever see a person hesitate to wake up for vacation in New York and come to Miami? But you tell him, wake up to do his about to do? No, and I can't, I don't time. Why? Think about why you're hesitating in life. It should teach you something. It should teach you. Who's causing the hesitation? Why am I hesitating in life? Why do I hesitate? I should hesitate across the board. But why am I not hesitating on entertainment? But I'm not hesitating on spirituality. Major hesitation. Where do you think it's coming from? The Eight Sahara. The Yates the hardest job in your life is to make you hesitate. Hesitate. You go out with a nice girl, she wants to get married, I have a bar mitzvah four months from now. Well, I hear the stories. My cousin's getting married, her dog's getting a haircut, I can't get married for six months. You hear the hesitation, any excuse comes out. 
Some of the people got married in 60 days. You hesitate one time. I never forget a friend of mine. He was going to use his trainer. And he says, I'm going to start January 5th. <laughs> never came January 5th. The minute you say January 5th, it's over. It's over. The minute you hesitate one day, it's over. It's over. Because tomorrow you're going to hesitate again. But why do we have such hesitations when we want to do something good? It's because this is the Yitzhahara. It prevents you from doing something good. But entertainment, I promise you, you will not even blink an eye. You will do it without any hesitation. So if you're, if you're hesitating in something spiritually, you'd rec- you need to recognize that that's specifically what you need to be doing. The hesitation that you're doing, if it's hard for you to do something, if, you can't, if you're hesitating all the time and it bothers you, that's exactly what you need to be doing. That is self-sacrifice. To he- not hesitate. You know how many times I woke up to exhaust it? That's it. Doing it anyway. Because now you get into a pattern. And there goes the pattern. Once you get into a pattern, you have to break. And this is what the three klipot are. The one klipa gets in your head. It confuses you. The second klipa gets into your heart. Gets you into fallen passions. And the third klipa is the worst. It makes you go into full-fledged retreat. You drop everything. How could a person drop everything? It doesn't make sense. That's a klipa. It's not us. It's not our true self. How could a person drop everything? It's not his true self. So when a person recognizes the reason why I'm going into it, you want know the third klipa do, does? It makes you go into despair. So when a person has a feeling of despair, he has a feeling of this, it's not him. You have to understand, this is the Yetzirah. I can't remember one time where... I've started, I'm going to do a big class, and I don't get this exhaustion that comes to me. Exhaustion. Like, I can't, like, how in the world am I going to teach this class? I get this fog of exhaustion that wants to just close my eyes and say, you know what? I can't do this. And it comes to me all the time, right before I do a class. But the bigger the class is, the bigger the exhaustion. And I have to really fight it. And I know it happens to me every single time. I almost look for the bad cloud to come, and look for it to go. It usually happens every time. So think about it. If I get these black clouds in my life, something good's happening. It's to make you fight. It's to make you self-sacrifice. It's to make you be like that woman with the katina. To run! Not to sit there, oh, I got a black cloud, let it rain, and sit in the rain. It's the times you have to move. You have to move. We'll do one more, one more lesson from 46. Rabbi Nachman says here, soul sacrifice is something we each have to do every single day. Giving money to tzedakah, praying is self-sacrifice. Any kind that you're giving is considered a self-sacrifice. Specifically, the sacrifice is the effort. Do not judge the, the results. Judge the effort. How much effort are you, do, are you trying to do something? Okay? person can say, I'm trying to do Shalom Bayit, I'm working on it, I'm praying 30 minutes a day, I'm working on this, I'm working on that. It's not the results, it's the effort. Don't let the Yetzirah confuse you with the results. You focus on one thing. How much time are you putting into it, and how much prayers are you putting into something? Don't confuse the results, because if you confuse the results, you're going you're gonna to leave. Just focus on the actual effort. And he's saying here, know that each person's obstacles in service and Creator are only according to what he can handle. There's no obstacle that's bigger than you. But he says from Nachman that the greatest obstacles that we have are the ones within our mind. It's when our heart is divided between, you know, sometimes I give a class in my recovery centers. They don't even know if they want to be clean. I asked them, you guys really want to be clean? Some say, I don't know. That's it. They can't hear my voice. Their heart's divided. Their heart's divided. I don't even know if... They, they don't even know. If you don't even know, <laughs> can I help you? But if we're ones that are all in, yes, this is what I want. They commit, ears are open. So ourselves, we have to. We have to first ask ourselves, do I really want this? Do I really want this? And that's the division in your heart. And he's saying here, the... the, the the, this is all coming from the, a person surrounded with what? With, which, which kushot? 
In Egypt, the biggest problem was kushot. They had a lot of kushot. They had a lot of questions about God. A lot of questions in life. And he says, well, how do you get rid of a kusha? How do you get rid of a question? If you have a question, it's driving you. It's giving you, it's creating chametz in your mind. It's trying to take over your subconscious. Rabbi Nachman says the only thing you need to do is cry out from the heart. When you cry out from the heart, and it says the word Shema Adonai Koli Echad, when you say Shema Adonai Koli Echad, God, oh God, hear my voice when I cry out, it's the same words as, the same words as kusha. It coll- your beliefs become collapsed. So it's very important. When we do anything, it's not enough to say, I'll try it. I'll try it! The voice has to strike the heart just like a shofar. What does a shofar do? The shofar removes the crookedness of the heart. When a person actually has and speaks loudly, that itself, that voice, that call, can have effect on his brain. He's got the, 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 he's got the, the cloud in his head. A person has to speak with force. In Rabbi Nachman's teachings, a person has to pray, cry out. Sometimes you hear, you go to Uman, they're screaming over there. You think somebody's getting robbed over there. They're screaming. They're screaming to their Father in Heaven. They're screaming. People, you've seen Uman, no, nothing crazy, a person screaming, oh, Father, help me. You go to another synagogue, they'll arrest you. In Uman, they scream. They're screaming, Father, help me. I'm st- help me. You would never, you, you, if you scream in Uma, you're like a normal person. <laughs> you scream in Surfside, they'll arrest you. What are you doing? Mr. Shugai is screaming. Because the cry from the heart, when you're confused, what am I going to do? Mindfulness? Just recycle the same garbage over and over? <laughs> Pay attention to the garbage I'm thinking about? That's not what's going to help me at that point. The problem is the collapse in the heart. The voice has to strike the mind, and when you pray with conviction, when you pray with energy, you have a physical effect on your mind. Your mind changes. Your energy changes. You scream. You have to sometimes scream it out. You see people lifting weights. They scream. You have to do the same thing. Once you do that, Rabbi Nathan says, once you do that, you remove the kushot in the heart. In the heart. And there's no question, Rabbi Nathan says, there, there is not times in your life when the moon is not appearing that you're not going to have you're not going to scream. That's all Hashem wants is a person to to serve Him with His heart, not with His lips, not with His iPhone. He wants Him to speak out loud, and when you scream like that and pray with force, you can break any negativity. He says even sometimes you can do a silent scream. Close your eyes, pretend nobody's there and scream from, like, from the depths of your heart, and you'll see a tremendous release that a person can have. You can have such a release. When you do that, I, I scream maybe 20 times a month. Screaming. Mindfulness doesn't help sometimes. It has to be a scream. Like when, the Jews, when God heard the cries of the Jews, they got saved. So I said, I'm a slave right now. I need to cry out. That's the kind of action you have to do. That is Rabbi Nachman. It's the difference between r- r- breast love teachings, breast love, soft heart. It's all the heart. It's very different from Chabad teachings, which is mindfulness. Rabbi Nachman knows that you're broken. He's not telling you're not going to be broken. And he says it's, it's okay to be broken. It's not okay to be depressed. A broken heart is very valuable in heaven because it teaches you that you're far away teaches you that you, you're, you're, you have a distance from God. The distance is the scream. The fact that I'm distant from my Creator, that's the cry I have. But when I get depressed, I run away from my Creator. I don't want to have anything to do with Him. I isolate myself. The scream eventually will turn into joy. The other thing will turn into isolation, suppression, God forbid other things. So tonight is a great night. That's why he says, do his vodadut at night. Scream. You need to scream. Get it off your chest. You need to, whatever's going on in a person's life, he needs to scream out. And when you scream out, like he says here, Shema Adonai Koli Akra. Oh God, hear my voice when I cry out. You will become, you'll, be, you'll get rid of all the difficult questions and all the illusions that you go through. 
I can't tell you, nobody in this world has it, a silver platter that they don't need to scream out. No matter who you are, you have, there's a form that ha you have to, God wants to hear your voice, and He wants to hear you from the heart. All right, that's today's class. Thank you.